Okay, so here we've skipped forward a little bit, and you can see that I've kind of worked, started working in this guy's, the Uber Reaver's kind of saddle turret, or the thing that General Rom's going to be sitting on. Um, this is the mechanical bits of the creature, and I really enjoy doing locust, the locust mechanics as, as well, almost as much as the organic stuff. With this, I'm using my standard method, obviously, um, I'll go in and draw a spline from the side view and then I'll bevel it out and then I'll do a symmetry modifier on it and adjust it and then I'll uh, flatten it down to an edit poly and then I'll apply an FFD box on it and kind of move things around or just scale things. Um, I do collapse my meshes just I like things clean it drives some of the guys crazy some of the modelers when they use my models as, as uh, reference or they open up my models, they want to see where I started and everything's collapsed down to an edit poly and all these things are attached in weird places. And It's kind of my method of working. If I start getting mired down in, in the technical aspects of this of the modeling, I'll start really getting frustrated with themselves. So nothing, none of their mechanics are designed to look comfortable or, you know, you, you don't look at a locust, uh, you wouldn't lo look at a locust, uh, uh, automobile or anything like that and say it was beautiful. Everything has to have this absolutely brutal, you know, attack, a sense of attack in it. So, I kind of, that's the kind of idea I'm, I'm keeping with this mechanical stuff. And you can see I'm, with the mechanic, the, this kind of turret arm that's coming off the back of this thing, I'm, again, it's reiterating parts or, or, reusing kind of shapes that I've used before and it kind of is similar to the abdomen or the wasp shape for the whole creature. Repetition and knowing how how much and how knowing how much to repeat something is important. And even though this guy doesn't use wings, I think it's important it was kind of a, you know, this is a little bit of a throwback to anime, but these little flyaway uh, spars or whatever you want to call them, shooting off the back of this thing. And I'm really just pushing forward, trying to get the whole bulk of this creature figured out. He's still feeling very incomplete, and my process is kind of to kind of go in and hit everything up front at least once. I try not to get too too detailed in one area before I flesh out the whole thing. So I want to get, because if you start detailing out one area and you haven't fleshed out the whole the whole model, then you'll run into the the fact that you know if when you do go to flesh it out or you know build the whole model you, you may realize that you completely went off on a, the wrong angle when you went into lots of detail. So it's like painting or sketching. Try to get everything in there on a base level up front before you go in and really start adding all the fun stuff. So I am thinking a little bit about what this guy is going to look like when he's in game. I kind of have in my head what parts are going to animate or what's going to look interesting when he's flying around in game. You don't want this, especially being a boss monster, you want things flailing around and, and bits moving. and So that's kind of in my head. Um, I'm not going to go in and figure out the total function until later. That's part of the detail pass. But I'm starting to think about it at this point. Here I'm adding a camera into the scene. I think it's pretty important when you're, when you're working this way to use a camera. Because you're in game, you know when when this model ends up in game, it's going to be at a typically a 90 degree FOV. So why not model using a 90 degree FOV concept model? So I'll toss a camera in there and spin it around, and if it looks good using this camera, then it'll probably look good in game. And it's just a it's me rechecking that I'm headed in the right direction. A 90 degree FOV can really do some funky stuff to a, to a model. 
So kind of second checking yourself is never a bad thing. And obviously he's still looking kind of thin, but I'm I haven't gotten all the little bits in there yet. Really need to work out his his complete profile and then I'll start worrying about his bulk and weight. Here we are again. I'm grabbing parts. I have enough unusual shapes in this model now that it's a, it's a lot easier just to grab parts from other sections and scale and move them around instead of, you know, building a new shape every time. That's another reason I love Max is you can grab any shape and if you freeform deform it or scale it or pull it or do a soft selection, you can turn it into anything. I really like weaponry, so I'm concentrating here on the on the gun. Maybe a little more than I should at this point, but I get excited about guns. I, I don't actually like shooting guns a whole lot, but I I like the mechanics behind them and kind of what they represent. And every locust has to have a really you know mean looking, completely badass weapon. So generally, with all my concepts, that's the first thing I'll hit is the gun. If I can get the gun looking cool, everything else will fall into place. So of course this guy has too many guns, and I threw those blade shapes on the end just to kind of break things up a little bit so it's not completely recognizable as a minigun. You can look at it and say, hey, you know, obviously they're using some kind of minigun, but it's grounded in locust technology. He's still pretty thin looking from the front. I'll have to worry about that later. contrasting these really unusual organic shapes with standard cylinders. I try not to use a cylinder too much, but it really is one of the most powerful shapes, I think. Throwing cylinders in as, you know, using them as bolts or caps or or whatever um, really provides focal points for the eye to rest. So I... I hate the fact that I can't come up with something better than a cylinder or a sphere, but y you can see on this guy that I've already put in, you know, it, a cylinder provides a hinge point, and it's recognizable, and your eye kind of sticks to it. With this mass of organic armor plating and, and things like that, you throw a cylinder in there, and it kind of it kind of brings you back to understanding what's going on. As far as materials go, you can see I just I've added just a, a simple kind of skin color and then a, a uh, kind of a metal color. I'm not going to worry about materials too much. I'll I'll really hit that in Photoshop. Um, but as far as as the modeling process goes, I at least like to know which parts are which and have it fairly decent looking when I'm spinning around in the viewport. It helps me visualize kind of what the final model's going to look like. Here I am grabbing a vent from another plate, you know, again, reusing the same shapes from another area. Really saves you a lot of time. People ask me quite a bit, where, where do I come up with my shapes? Um, how do I, how do I work out in my head you know these some of them are fairly unusual shapes and and the ways I put them together I I don't know exactly how to describe where I come up with this stuff um, it may just be practice uh, I can't I've and I, I don't know how to tell people how to instruct people how to make you know how to work on their shapes it's just one of these things that you have to practice for a while I suppose And I think it's a result of, of years of just really pushing myself to kind of break free from what was comfortable. You know, back when I started concepting, I'd really rely on what a, what had been done before. And I'd, I'd always have all these reference books from, you know, Star Wars and all these old sci-fi books, you know, sci-fi paintings and sci-fi book covers. And I'd really rely on all the shapes that people before me had made. 
And as a result, my stuff kind of looked like what had been done before. And it wasn't until I started getting confident enough to put all those books on the shelf and start coming up with my own shapes that um, I really I really got a footing on, on doing something unique. But that takes a couple, you know, it takes a couple years of really, really hammering yourself, pushing yourself to try new things and come up with your own style. It's not going to happen overnight. It's, you know, I, I hate to say it, it's fairly painful, you know. But that's usually when I, I can tell... When I when I look at someone's portfolio who is just starting out or you know is is kind of wet behind the ears, you can tell looking at their uh, at their work that their 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 choice in shapes isn't mature. I guess it's so hard to describe. <laughs> it's like everything in concepting. It's a very gray area. Concepting in general is a kind of a gray profession. We have to concept artists have to define kind of what their position is in a company and how valuable they are. And the fact none of our work ever really ends up in the final product, the game, you know, that's that's really unusual too. We'll spend all these hours working on something and it doesn't even end up in the final product for the for what we're working on. So Here I am just reiterating or reusing shapes again. This goes back to that thing I was talking before about kind of sea creatures. I remember when I was, uh, God, what was it? I think it was at the beach and I was eating a crab or something, and I mentioned before how gross it was. And I cracked this thing open and it had all these little frilly gills and weird fat and stuff inside it, and it absolutely disgusted me. I guess I should, uh, excuse me, I guess I shouldn't have looked down when I was eating it, but that always stuck to me so now whenever I do even with this locust mechanic stuff undersides of things or interiors of parts I'll put these little frilly bits because it reminds me of that disgusting crab <laughs> and it kinda gives a sense that this locust stuff is it's it's a shell or you know it's an armor bit that's covering all the mechanical underpinnings in the internal workings of this uh of the mechanics as you can tell i'm not super interested in i'm not concerning myself with how absolutely functional this thing needs to look because it is meant to be sort of alien and and we don't necessarily need to know, you know, this thing runs on gasoline and here's the exhaust and, you know, that's not really a concern for the locust mechanics. It's it's more that it just looks like something a little something out of the ordinary and something extremely painful. <laughs> and you don't want to fight it. So everything's kind of sharp and jagged, like I said before. Here I'm just doing a little soft selection here, just moving stuff around. Again, I don't care that shape, you know, that polygons are floating through each other or anything like that. So at some point you may be asking, you know, when is too much detail on these models? And with this guy, I'm not even close yet. Uh, I thought I knew what detail was before I started working at Epic, and then I saw what these guys were doing, and you know they'll have the bolts and rivets and everything modeled out. So
once again drawing these overloaded plates and and it's like things are you know sh shelled on top of each other it also gives that sense of perhaps this thing moves you know by you know it kind of telescopes somehow it's really nice when you're doing a 3d model like this that you can actually use an in-game like the little locust guy I have on here is the actual in-game model for Gears of War so when I grab him you know I'll use the in-game models as much as I can for for a benchmark for my concept model so that way when I am doing this concept I know exactly the proportions I know how things are supposed to move according to what's already in game it's really a great tool and yet another reason why I like using 3D is because I can build things based exactly on what already exists in game So again, um, it's kind of like uh, if you've ever been driving down the highway for a long trip or something like that, you'll, you know, you'll be driving for an hour and you'll kind of snap to and realize, you know, how did I get here? And you zone out, you zone out while you're driving and you don't remember the past hour. You just know that you've been driving down the road and your mind wandered. And a lot of the time that'll happen with me when I'm doing this concept art. And I actually read about it um, with... Olympic athletes, they'll go into this zone where they're not thinking about, you know, the race or the, you know, the event that they're doing. They'll just go into this zone where they're, they've, they're so practiced at it that they're, I guess their subconscious takes over. And it's strange, but that, that happens to me usually when I get into this, when I get to this point in a model, I'll, I'll start working and I'll snap to a couple hours down the line and won't even remember how I got to this point. But it's usually my most creative point. And here I've decided those back those back spines aren't interesting enough. So I'm going to go in here and kind of break them up a little bit. They look fairly standard, you know, they look like wings or toothpicks sticking off the back of this guy. So I need to do something to it to make it a little more interesting than just, you know, the, the one spine sticking off. And again, it's just having enough practice to know when it's time to try a different shape. So that's a little more interesting and, and possibly will add another little point of articulation. I love designing towards function. Um, I worked on Unreal Tournament 3. In fact, I was working on it at the same time I was, I was doing uh, Gears of War. And a lot of Unreal Tournament 3 dealt with these first-person weapons. And what was so important about the first-person weapons in Unreal Tournament 3 was they were, they were designed around the way they functioned. Usually the, the designer, um, Steve Polge, would come up with uh, just an idea of what the weapon was supposed to do and I would start working on the way it would fire and shoot before I even came up with the form and then the form would follow form follows function so when I was working on Gears of War stuff none of it had as much articulation as the as the weapons and vehicles from Unreal Tournament but I always keep in mind that building in sections that could possibly animate or you know you could put a couple bones in there or the animators could put a couple bones in there and, and have another part that articulates um, always adds interest so by breaking up this wing with that little crack down the side or down the middle it's just another way that instead of one pivot on this thing you could have two so you know when it's flying around these things could flail out even more I really like to think about the way things function. Um, I get a lot of enjoyment out of actually making things work. 
And I also like to do little animations on them. On on this guy, I'll, I'll I don't think I'll show it on this DVD, but I'll do a little animation to show what parts move and figure out the pivots and all that for the animators when they when it comes time for them to uh, take the end game model and start doing their stuff. They'll have I'll render out a little movie of where I think the pivots and and whatnot should be and what parts should move. And again, it's just another case of me spending it may be a little more time on my end as far as the concept goes but it saves them a lot of time further down the road and it makes it a more cohesive in-game model when when i figured out the animations the base materials and i have this 3d 3d model for for everyone to work off of everyone knows kind of what the final thing might look like so it's not a case of having a 2d sketch and the modeler does his interpretation of it and then the animator kind of looks at the 2d sketch and then does their interpretation of what they what they think it is it's just more concrete i think um in the 3d level at least that's how it works at epic you know um it's probably it's of course different for different different places but at epic games it works out really well at least i think so i hope so add some little spikes just to break up the uh, silhouette a little bit, make it a little more interesting. Just cylinders, again. Bevel, extrude, nothing crazy. I use booleans a lot as well, which are really nasty, and sometimes will really crash my machine, but you can really come up with some interesting stuff by just doing a boolean and flipping flipping things around and seeing what comes out. And here I'm going to take one of the spines and actually make it into a, uh, a piston for this little wing thing. I want to kind of define how this that this thing is mechanical. So adding some real world elements to it like a piston or a control arm will kind of bring it back and not make it so completely alien. So yeah, that's a lot more interesting, and if I copy that over a couple times, it should be fairly cool looking. I'll just throw a group on here and copy it over a couple times. If I were to sit down and try to draw this in 2D, it would never happen, obviously. I don't think, just the way my brain works, I couldn't come up with this which is so yeah I'll just I'll use the mirror tool quite a bit as well just mirror things over and that's a lot more interesting than what I had before it's starting to get intricate. I really like things to be intricate and detailed. So we're we're getting there. We're getting. I'm starting to get excited about this thing at this point. Um, I think we got something that that's going to be pretty cool. And I think it, um, as I look at this, I mentioned before having a hook with something. I think the hook on this thing is just going to be the way this rear turret moves. I'm starting to see it as 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 the creatures flying or moving through the air that this rear turret has so many hinge points and stuff on it that it's almost floating you know it's undulating kind of snake like behind it with the with the with these wing spines kind of moving up and down and kind of this flowing feeling so we'll have the tentacles out front or kind of flying behind that are flowing and then this turret will be kind of flowing up and down should be really interesting
Again, I just keep spinning stuff around. Got to look at it from every angle. Also, spinning it around kind of gives my my brain a break so that I can look at things and, and ponder them. I found that Mountain Dew really helps me out a lot, too. If I really get stuck, I'll go chug a Mountain Dew, and it seems like it kind of opens the floodgates. <laughs> That's not an endorsement for Mountain Dew, by the way. Any soda is fine. Anything with tons of caffeine in it. <laughs> so as I look at this, I'm getting these really cool looking spine things on the back that I'm happy with. And the rest of the body is looking kind of uh, weak. So I'm going to have to go in at some point and give this guy some mass. He's also starting to look, a the mechanical bits are starting to look fairly heavy with, with all these little bits I'm putting on so he need the creature itself is gonna have to get a uh, we're gonna have to put in a, him on some steroids so that he can actually carry all this stuff that I'm strapping on to him I really don't think concepting this way would have been uh, wouldn't have been a viable option even five years ago, at least in the game industry. Um, it's next. It's these next-gen games that demand models that are so much more intricate and, and involved that concepting to this degree um, has really become something you can pull off. If I were to do, you know, some of the games I worked on five years ago, if I were to go to this amount of detail they would have told me it was absolutely a waste of time you know there was it wasn't necessary and that's exciting because that means possibly concepting is just going to get more and more involved you know it's it's not going to be just drawing orthos and 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 uh you know doing model sheets god forbid i hate doing model sheets but maybe the role of the concept artist will continue to take on new facets Hopefully they do. Absolutely tell you, I'd tell you you're crazy. There's no way that I'd be doing this kind of stuff. So it's it's really a, a cool thing to be part of this industry, a concept artist in this industry, and how quickly things are evolving and changing. It's also terrifying for a guy like me to see kids coming out of school that are doing this kind of thing. Um, it really keeps old guys like me on our toes. In fact, when I went to school, there, were, there was no, there wasn't, there was no such thing as, as concept artists. I, now they, now they have programs in college, and that's just, it's fascinating to me. Okay, so we uh, we've leaped forward a little bit here, and obviously I've I've continue adding details to this guy. Um, basically, it's just taking parts and and continuing to copy them and and repeat shapes. I've also given this guy a little bit of uh, I mentioned before about putting this guy on a weightlifting program so they can handle all this mechanical bulk that I'm throwing on the, on his back. So. You'll see here when I flip back that the uh, the creature itself I've bulked out a little bit, giving him some lats and shoulders and all that kind of thing. Here I'm going in, uh, doing a little edit poly, going to recess an area. Um, we're getting to the point now where I'm I'm thinking about details and adding surface detail to these overall basic shapes that I've created. So. I'll start recessing areas, making it look like uh, you know there's some plating going on and things like that. And I'm sure for you people out there who are absolute ac experts at 3D Studio Max, I'm sure I'm using really arcane ways of going about this stuff. Archaic, sorry. Um, I never got into using hotkeys or anything like that, and as a result, I'm. I, it's one of those things where it's like riding a bike at this point. The way I use Max, and to try to do it any other way would completely slow me down. 
I'm so familiar with, with modeling this way that I don't have to think about it. And I think that's an important step um, in concepting is when, especially using these 3D programs or using any kind of format to do a con that's that's sort of the mind share that you're not actually putting into the design. So it's one of those things where it's just practice, practice, practice makes perfect. And you'll get to a point where you're not thinking about the tools anymore. You know, I don't think about, okay, what should I use to make this shape? Should I bevel it? Should I loft it? You know, it, I'm so familiar with the way I go about it that I don't even, con I'm not even thinking about the tool set or how I approach it or using different techniques. I'm totally concerned with the design. A hundred percent about the design. So I guess it, you know it, you could use that bike analogy. When you first learn to ride a bike you don't worry about going off ramps and doing 360 flips off jumps because you're so worried about actually riding the bike. It's only once you completely are familiar and are not thinking about riding the bike that you start really getting into the tricky stuff. So that's something to consider when you're starting out and I was talking about where you're not concerned about how you're gonna do it. You just it's it's just you're like on complete autopilot. So as I'm throwing in more shapes and adding detail here, I was I was talking about kind of kids going to to college now for concept art and it's funny because I was talking to uh, um, the only reason I'm able to talk about this is because this DVD is so long and, and I get to ramble on about stuff so forgive me <laughs> but um, I was talking to one of my buddies who's a college professor and he's teaching concept art at a, at a local university and I asked him I said you know one of the most important things about concept art is it's beyond being able to draw and it's beyond you know, having this an exceptional talent to draw monsters or what have you. It's being able to take direction and deal with the frustrations of, you know, possibly having to redo stuff. And so I, I presented to him that in his curriculum, maybe he should have his students, um, you know, do a project, do a concept, and then come in and tell them the whole thing's wrong and to start over and do that three or four times. And that would be really good training on how to, uh, on what it's like to be a concept artist. And of course, he told me that would never work because kids, uh, you know, you're paying tuition. And you don't want you don't want your students getting so frustrated that they don't want to come to class. <laughs> but I think that's an important part of the industry that perhaps kids aren't getting is is having to deal with the pressures of working as an artist in a business environment and. It's, it's one of those kind of gray areas in concept art. We're production artists, but we're, we're kind of... It's a very gray area, concept art, and... It's not defined. It's different for every studio. And I think it's... Uh, the valuable concept artist is the guy that can walk in and kind of assess how a studio is set up and he can effectively make himself fit into that that process at that studio and also if he has if you're walking in as a concept artist to make yourself a valuable part of the team because concept art is such a gray area you know none of the stuff we do ends up in game a lot of the time you could probably do a 15 minute sketch and the modeler could work off of it and build an in-game model um, it's it's making yourself valuable that's that's important for a successful concept artist making the team feel like without you the game wouldn't be made how you go about that is just you know assessing how the team works and how you fit into that process and how you can evolve yourself to be important to everyone else there but it's so it's different for every company i swear and that's i think that's one of the most important parts of being a concept guy. It's not just drawing these pretty pictures. And I mentioned it, it, it can be frustrating that, you know, for instance, this guy right here, I'm doing all this work, this 3D model, and if it weren't for this DVD, 
chances are no one except maybe the 15 guys that are working on it or you know on the team on my art team will ever see it how do, how do you deal with that as a concept guy because as an artist you're used to your you know you work towards your your work being shown you know being viewed by other people um i think a lot of a lot of people in the industry hopefully realize this about concept artists and they'll they'll you know, developers will be pretty good about letting your poster stuff on the internet or on forums once the product shipped. But that's something you kind of have to deal with in your own head, you know, is taking pride in work, even though only four or five people may see it. That's that's part of the uh, being a concept guy. I can't stress enough, again, another thing, another aspect of being a successful concept guy, at least in my opinion, is is having pretty good communication skills and being receptive to other people's ideas. Um, if you're not able to convey your ideas or discuss ideas up front or have a you know, a, a good level of communication, there's going to be an absolute disconnect between you and the designer. And being able to talk out your ideas is extremely important. And also being forgiving enough to accept other people's ideas and possibly forg forego things that you have in your head. I can't tell you how many times that I've thought, you know, I've read the design doc and, and just absolutely thought it was the most you know, it just didn't fit into my idea of, of the way a certain creature or something should be. And how often I've been wrong. <laughs> but that's why I'm not a game designer. You know, I, I'm not the best at coming up with video game ideas. And I realize that. And so I don't try to force that. I'll usually, I usually accept the fact that the designers are the guys that, you know, they're the brains behind the brawn here. So... But no one wants to to work with a concept artist that is a what a how a pain in the butt or fights every idea every design that comes down. So sometimes you really have to bite the bullet, and it, it's tough. Sometimes you'll really get married to, like say for instance, I'm working on this guy, and I've got him to a point where I'm really excited about him. You know, I, I'm I'm really pumped up that this is the way it should be, and you know, it'll come down the pipe that, okay, we want to take the tentacles off and give them, give them an elephant trunk instead, you know, something like that. And I just think it's, you know, I just, in my head, I can't get behind it. Sometimes you absolutely have to bite the bullet and, 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 and go with it. That's your job as a concept artist. But you have to balance it with kind of sticking up for your principles as well or what you think is a good design. And that comes with years and confidence working for a few years in the industry and concepting. You start to really you can determine yourself what makes for a good design. <clears throat> Just always got to remember to bite that bullet sometimes. <laughs> So I guess I should talk a little bit here about what I'm doing. Um, obviously, I got things isolated. Here goes some Boolean. I really like, again, with the cylinders, these little hole patterns, these little great hole patterns. I use these in a lot of my designs. In fact, you can probably find a great hole pattern in almost every design I do. Um, this is what I had to rely on. <laughs> it's funny. At Epic, we have a rule, no hazard stripes. And I, I believe this is a rule that... My previous art director Jerry Jerry O'Flaherty came up with, and hazard stripes are one of those things in science fiction, particularly that when you can't think of anything else, you toss a hazard stripe on it, and it all of a sudden takes on whatever meaning a hazard stripe has. And Jerry, I guess, deduced that this had completely been overdone, and 
every game that he worked on and every game since that Epic has done, I can I can pretty much guarantee you're not going to find any hazard stripes. It's become kind of this it's it's a rule, no hazard stripes. So in lieu of using hazard stripes, I I use my little great pattern. <laughs> I call it my, my machine gun holes. You know, these are the holes that make the uh, like the M60 machine gun and everything look really cool. So, I'll throw some machine gun holes in here. You can see up top on the turret, I've given I've given the uh, mini gun kind of a, these canisters. Again, they're not completely functional at all, but. With the locust stuff, we don't absolutely have to explain how things work. You got some bullet shells and things up there. So, again, bullets. Love. I love rows of bullets. Lo <laughs> machine gun bullets and machine gun holes. You can add them to any concept, and it'll it'll absolutely make it uh, the best concept you've ever done. <laughs> You can see there on the back of the head, I've got the little spiky shapes that I had on the uh, on the tail tail spars. And there's not a whole lot of horizontal and perp perpendicular lines going on here. And that's also a another. The the Unreal Engine Unreal Engine three is really good at picking up kind of rounded, you know, these rounded surfaces. So that's kind of what got me started in in not doing absolutely horizontal, perpendicular, ninety degree angles is because the Unreal Engine is so good at picking up, you know, curves on surfaces and 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 uh, it just kind of floated over into the way I concept now. You notice on the front end there, I, I added the little um, the claw things on the tentacles. And here I'm tossing a light into the scene. At this point, the guy is fleshed out enough, um, and I'm comparing him to the old sketch I had. And hopefully it's better than the old sketch at this point. But I'll throw a light into the scene, and I'm going to render out a little movie for um, for the art meetings that we have.